Okay, good morning, everyone. I wanna remind and encourage everybody to join us for our Swiss learning programming. There's a lot going on. I think we have over 25 learning opportunities. I'm not expecting that you're gonna to go to the zero to five, you know, story time outside with Dobie Grocer, but there's a tremendous amount of learning opportunities, both at night and during both days. Um, during the first day, we have um, about three to four hours shiurim straight in the afternoon. The really great stellar lineup of uh, individuals from our community. And on the second day, we added one or two more, one, one more shear with uh, several divrei Torah also at the barbecue as well to really take advantage of the opportunities we have to be makabal the Torah on Shus. Which brings us to Bamidbar. Special opportunity. We're beginning Bamidbar right before Shavuos. That's not by accident, that is, that is intentional. Uh, through the words of Chazal and um, in the Gemara in Masech's Megillah, they explain that we have a halacha that before the year begins, before the year begins, we need to say and lay in the klalos, the curses. That was last week in Bechu Kosai. And then Tosvos in Masech's Megillah writes, we don't go. There's a concept called Tichla Shana Vikilosa. You have to end the year in its curses and begin the new year with its blessings. So we look at the new year. The new year is Tishrei. So in Tishrei, we do this. Before Tishrei, before Rosh Hashanah, we always lay in Kitavo and eat some of them. Some of the curses in it. And then we go into the new year. The truth is, there's always a buffer. There's always a buffer. Now, uh, Nitzavim, Vayelach is always before, Nitzavim is always before Rosh Hashanah because you shouldn't go straight from the Kalos into Rosh Hashanah. Chazal say the mission of Rosh Hashanah tells us that Shavuos is also a type of Rosh Hashanah and therefore Bechukosai always falls out before, before Shavuos. That's why there's all this gymnastics with the double parshas, single parshas, which is, it's so confusing. I gave, uh, I would say, it wasn't a drusha. It was in the drusha slot about three weeks ago. It was like a mini shear on explaining why there's a major discrepancy between Eretz Israel and America for the next bunch of weeks. And the Mabit writes that this is the way that we got it right. We don't always get it right, but Bichukosai is two Shabbos and before Shavuos. Then you have Bamidbar, and then you go into Shavuos. Sometimes in America, it works out where you have Naso also. This year in Israel, they have Naso as well. But the ideal way, the ideal minhag is to have the Chukosai, Bamidbar into Shavuos, where it's a little bit of a buffer. If there's too much of a buffer, then you don't notice the Salacha. That's what the, the Bali told us, right? That if you have two parashios before. So it's intentional, Rodruk writes, that Bamidbar also needs to be before Shuz, right? So what is unique about Bamidbar that puts it before Shuz? So I wanna share the following thought from Rav Druk. He says that the Torah was given in three ways. The Torah was given, Chazal say, the Eish, Bamayim, Ubamidbar. Where the Torah is compared to three things. What was the third one? Midbar. It was the, 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 desert. Ish, Mayim, and Midbar. 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 Okay? That the Torah was given through fire, through water, and in the desert. Okay? So, by Yedabar Hashem, Moshe bin Midbar Sinai, the reminds us that the Torah was given in the Midbar. Now, what does this mean? Asked of Druk, what does this mean that the Torah is given to in these three places, in this in three ways? And the Torah is also compared to Aish, Mayim, and Midbar. What does this mean? So I want to share two approaches. The first is from Rameir Shapiro. Rameir Shapiro was Ochat to be in his yeshiva two weeks ago in Yeshiva's Chachme Lublin. And in his Sefer, Imre Das, Al Torah, he says the following very nice idea. He says all three of these represent different types of sacrifice the Jewish people went through throughout their history. First and foremost, Avram Avinu. What was the first test that Avram Avinu went through? Kivshan Haish, right? He went through a personal Nisayon 
wasn't in the most famous story that's not in the Torah, that we think is in the Torah. He went through Kivshana Eish and emerging from, first going through and emerging from Kivshana Eish, he's no longer Avram, he's, right, he's Avraham Avinu. Secondly, the Jewish people went through an Isayon of water. Where was that? Kriyas Yamsov, great. Kriyas Yamsov, two for two, very good. Two for two. The Jewish people went through Kriyas Yamsov. Again, a threat to, threat to the nation. What should we do? Should we go back to the Mitzrayim? Should we, go, should we go through the water? That's number two. And number three, the Midbar. So he said, what's the Midbar? The fact that we left Egypt and we went into a Midbar without any food, money, any support at all, and we just said complete bitach and Hashem is within itself a test. Leich teich acharai the midbar of Eretz lo zerua, as the Navi's Navi um, Yirmiyahu writes, after for the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So he says that these three types of ways the Torah was given represent that the Torah, if we want to be part of the Torah, we need to give up of ourselves. There needs to be a certain level of Messiah's Nefesh. There are certain things that we, if one wants to be learning Torah, one wants to be living a life of Torah, as true, I think, with anything in life, that means that there's going to be things that one would, will give up to live a life of Torah. Avraham did that on a personal level, right, individual level, and the Jewish people did that on a national level in two different ways, into the Midbar, and through and through the Yamsin. Yeah, Yasin. A month, what do you mean a month of food? Uh huh. So they, I, they definitely took food. They definitely took, you're right, they took money, but they know where, you're right, they took money, but I don't know where they. The, well, they didn't know the month was going to happen. The month started on, no, it wasn't right away. It was Parsha B'Shalach. So it was after the Yamsuf. So it was after the Yamsuf, a, a few days after, whenever that was. Some argue, some argue is Lagba Omer, which is what day in ER? About a month, about a month, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Chassim Sofer has a has, has a piece on it. He said, he argues that's that's what. They, they thought they were going to Israel yeah. straight, so it wouldn't have taken more than that month to get there. So you're saying it's not such a challenge to right. go into the going? Okay. Yeah, it turned out to be a challenge. Yeah. Because of circumstances. Right. But uh, when they left, uh, right, it didn't seem like a big deal. Right. But it was it was an unknown going into this vast place. It was an unknown. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the way that's the way the Navi Yirmiyahu expresses it that it was going into a vast unknown, even if they had certain levels of support, it's going into a vast unknown. You know, right? Yeah. So, I th I have a greater appreciation just going to Poland last week for what people went through when they went to a new land. You're right, they were running away from horrors in Europe, but to start over in a brand new country with a new language and new culture is something that is so, so, so difficult to do. And to tell a whole nation, leave Egypt, right? You've been there for over 200 years, right? Leave Poland, seven, what was it, 700 years, a thousand years, Jewish people were there. And go into, you know, that within itself is so hard to do. It's so hard to do. So that is the approach of the Imre Dabai. So how many grades are there? Yes. Somebody just, making yeah, coffee. Yeah, yeah, oh, just on a personal like side, my mother-in-law, may she rest in peace, left on the last plane out of, Essen, no, out of Germany, train. last train out of Germany. The whole family went to Auschwitz. She was 18 years old. Wow, wow, thank you for sharing. Yeah, and, and, and went. Six hundred thousand men. It's probably more. Six hundred thousand men. So probably it was like two to three million. Two to three million people left. How many people yeah. stay? I didn't leave. So that is a. It's a 
four to five million. Some say some up to fifteen to twenty died. Some didn't stay. They they died. They died in Mount Scotia. Didn't stay. They were you know they didn't make it. They didn't make it out. The second approach is from the Ksav Sofer, Eish Mayim and Midbar. He says that these represent three attributes that one needs to have in order to be, you know, to be somebody that's Makabal the Torah. Number one is Mayim. Mayim is something that is an element of the war of the world that always goes down, right? Always goes down, which represents Anivas. The Gemara Tainus writes, Lama Nimshla Divrei Torah Lamayim. Torah is compared to water. It automatically goes down. So too, Torah is received to be receptacle of Torah. One needs to be humble. Needs to be somebody that's, that's, has a, 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 has humility. That is Moshe Rabbein, for example, is the greatest. Adam. He was the greatest receptacle for Torah. If one wants to be a Kli, my daughter wants me to take her to the container store. You know to the container store? She saw it. She's like, oh my gosh, this is a, she's very organized. One of my kids is very organized. She's like, it's a dream. It's like, forget about Toys R Us, which is Allah Shalom. You know, she's like the container store, right? So to be a container of Torah, one needs to have animus. That needs to be there. It's not about me, right? It's about us. It's about we, Rabbi Sachs would say. It's not about me, it's about we. It's not about my skills, it's about what I can give to the world. The second is Aish. Aish is the opposite of Mayim in many ways. One of them is water goes down, Aish goes up, right? It always goes up. And I always think about this, I'm staring at the Hanukkah candles. And they, they, they always, you know, they're always flickering up. And that represents the passion that somebody has in Judaism. We need passion to ignite that flame, to be excited about what we do. It's not just another Shabbos meal, not just another three-day yantav, oh, we're just gonna go through the motions to get through it. Eish das lamo, the Torah itself is a living thing and it's our, our life, literally, and it's the passion that can get us connected to Torah. And the third is the midbar. The midbar, we alluded to this a second ago, the midbar is bitachon. Midbar is, you know, relying on Hashem as our guide in keeping the Torah. Sometimes it's not easy to follow a certain halacha, a certain mitzvah. Maybe it's not cool. Maybe it's not, it's not comfortable with uh, the people you're around. Maybe it's not something that, you know, um, fits with everything else, the culture that we live in. But you need a certain level of bitachon, of midbar, to have that. To, so to be somebody that's makabal the Torah, these are three attributes, anivas, humility, passion, and bitachon, reliance on a Kaddish Baruch Hu. That's the Ksav Sofer. The Ksav Sofer, so Rav Druk adds to this something very, very beautiful. He says, if you think about it, these elements are mutually exclusive. You can't have fire, water, and midbar in, all, in the same place. You can't have fire and water in the same place. It's impossible. Right? That's, that's simply not possible. Bara, maybe that was the only time in history where we had Aish and Mayim together. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. It can't exist. They can't coexist. Fire and Midbar work well together, but water and Midbar do not work well together. Usually the definition of a Midbar is something that is bereft of Mayim. So by definition, right, all three can't be together in the same place, in the same location. So he says what this uh, Rav Druk points to us is that we need everybody to makabal the Torah together. Not each person can be perfect on their own. You could only achieve perfection, right, of Torah if we're all working together on all cylinders, right? It's, you know, you could think of every sports analogy ever, right? You need every person on the team to be playing well in order for the team to play well. If one person is not doing well, it doesn't work. The pitcher can be a great pitcher, but the catcher can't catch. Forget about it, it's all over. You have, you know, wild pitch after wild pitch. It's not going to work, et cetera, et cetera. So he says, when it comes to Klal Yisrael, we need all three, but that all three is by every, every, everybody together. And this should give, it, give us chizak. He quotes the Rambam. The Rambam is a beautiful Rambam at the end of Hilkos Talmud Torah. Some people have the minhag, very nice minhag, to learn a chapter of Hilkos Talmud Torah at the table over, over the, the meals on Shavuos. 
Very nice minhag. And Shavuos, add a little bit more Torah to your table. I'm sure everybody has and shares the Torah, but Shavuos is different. So you can start early, you can start on Shabbos, and to ensure that you have this, this notion. So he quotes the Ram, and the Ram writes, the Shloshe Ksarim, Nechter Yisrael. The Jewish people were given three crowns. Keser Torah, this is, again, uh, so similar language to the Mishnah Bikyavos. Keser Torah, Keser Kahuna, and Keser Malchus. Three different you know, three different um, uh, crowns, Torah, priesthood, and kingship. Keser kahuna zacha bo'am. Kahuna, sorry. Okay, if you're Yisrael, sorry, buddy. Like, it's not going to work, right? Only, that only goes to the Kohan. Keser malchus only goes to the children, progeny of David HaMelech. Keser Torah, munach v'omedu muchan l'kol Yisrael. Keser Torah is there and prepared for anybody and everybody. Shnemar, Torah tzivalanu Moshe, Mora shaki hilas yankov. Kol misha yirtza, yavo v'yito. Anybody that can go, can go ahead and take this part of Torah. And that is reflected in this notion, esh my midbar, you can't have all three. Everybody can find their own personal chilak in the Torah itself. The same chalkenu, that is what um, Rav Druk adds to the beautiful Ksav Sofer, that each person has their own chilek, and that is there and prepared for them on their own. That is idea, say number one, maybe one and two. Okay. Uh, second thought. Second thought comes also from Rav Druk, but we'll see. Here he quotes somebody else, it's really nice. So, the Eilat told us Aaron Umoshe, the Yom di Ber Hashem is Moshe Bahar Sinai. Chapter three begins with the following pasuk. The following pasuk. The Eilat told us Aaron Umoshe, the Yom di Ber Hashem is Moshe Bahar Sinai. These are the generations of Moshe and Aaron. Aaron and Moshe. Again, here Aaron first. Sometimes the Moshe's first. So you tell me what's wrong with the next pasuk. The Eilat Shmos Bnei Aaron, Habachor Nadav Avihu Elazar Vitamar. Right? These are the children of Aaron. So we're Moshe's children. So Rashi says, Ve'eno maskir ela b'nei Aaron. He only mentioned the children of Aaron. Ve'nikru todos Moshe. Why are they called the todos of Moshe? Lefisha lamdan Torah. Because Moshe taught them Torah. Melame shekol ha-melame des ben chadera Torah. Ma'la lavakas of kilu yodo. You learn from here, that anybody that teaches a child Torah, it's as if they raised them, as if they raised them. So, and that is a beautiful thought. At the end of the school year, teachers, we have to have a tremendous amount of respect for teachers and for them teaching us, teaching our children Torah. It's not a question. What they, talking about sacrifice, what they give up to choose the profession to be teaching the next generation and getting kids excited for Torah is something that we cannot be forgotten on our generation. It's not a question. But I want, yeah. It's the obligation of the father to teach his child. So if he gives that obligation over to a rabbi, yeah. the rabbi is doing what the father should. So you're saying that's how, that's the mechanics. That's how it works. Because it's the father, and if the father doesn't do it, then it's, it goes over. Okay, right. very nice. Yeah. It's similar to a bris source. So the obligation is also on the father to do so. The obligation on the father, and then the Gemara says there's like three levels. Yeah. And it goes to close. Then it eventually goes to call Yisrael. See, Torah gave the bris mila. That would, it's a, yeah. It could be that it works the same way. And I want to direct you to the Orachayim HaKadosh. Orachayim says something very, very beautiful. He says a different answer than Rashi. How are these children of Aaron considered the children of Moshe? He says that after, uh, the puzzle does the following. Ub Aaron his anaf Hashem lahashmido. Hashem was very angry with Aaron after Chet Egel. It's pasuk in the Varim. Doesn't say this in, in the Chet Egel story itself. Lahashmido to destroy Aaron. So what does that mean? Chazal say that initially 
Hashem wanted to kill, right? Part of the Chet Ego would be that Aaron would lose two of his sons there, Elazar Tamar, and he would also lose Nadavavi a little bit later. What happens? Moshe Davins. Moshe is saying in the verb that I davened that you wouldn't lose Elazar and Vitamar. Rashi says this also elsewhere. Rashi says that in the end of the story of Har Sinai, it says that there are certain people that saw Hashem and Hashem didn't touch them. And Hashem didn't touch them. So Rashi points out that it was the children of Aaron behaving inappropriately. They did, so they were like eating and drinking while experiencing the, the Matan Torah experience. It was inappropriate. And Hashem wanted to do something then. He didn't want to share the simcha of Matan Torah, so he waited. You can ask, definitely ask the question, what about the simcha of the Chanukah Samishkan? Okay, I, it's a good question. I don't have an answer to that question. But, but um, he waited. So you see there, Moshe is saying, Moshe Davin Hashem, not to kill all of Aaron's kids. So the Yom Diber Hashem. So you see here, he's, the Orchaim wants to express that how are these Aaron's, that these are also Moshe's children? Moshe davened for the kids. And davening, right? Davening for somebody else to have children, or here to perpetuate, to keep the kids, that within itself, the Torah is recognizing, is like you raised them, is like you had them. It's a beautiful thought. It's a beautiful thought. There are so many people that struggle with infertility, struggle with having, for, ha having children. Sometimes it's giving them chizuk, but I think a lot of us struggle with like what, what, what to say and how to say it, et cetera. To daven for them is the, is the greatest bracha you can give them. Yeah. I can we also say also that the Torah says it this way. Like we learned in Shabbat about the grandchild of Moshe Rabbeinu. It seems that maybe his family went a little bit astray. And since he did daven for our children, maybe this was like kind of his adopted family. But his, his family might have gone. Maybe in a little bit of the wrong direction. So you're saying this is more of like, a, right, off of Shoftim, where we learned Pesel Micha, that the Levi was a grandchild of, of Moshe. Maybe this is like sort of saying Moshe. Moshe also, what he did, this is like his children. Right. Don't only look at your, right, that's not, not, that's not going to end well. We, there's a Ksav Sofer elsewhere that writes that Rashi says that Moshe was jealous of the way that Aaron died. Aaron died by Misas Nashika, which is apparently like the least painful death closest to God. Also, Miriam died that way also. And Moshe wanted that. He was Misave. He desired the death of Aaron. So the Ksav Sofer says homiletically, it wasn't literally the death of Aaron that he wanted. He wanted the Nachas. He wanted the Nachas of the next generation. Aaron got that. Aaron, but not everybody can get that fully, completely, or at all. And he wanted to show him, listen, look what you did. Look what you did for Klal Yisrael. Like, yeah, not everybody, it's not, it's, not, it's not your fault. It's not your fault what happens, you know? That's a different sheer. It's a different sheer about that. But look, look what else you accomplished. Lubavitch Rebbe, they say, well, they didn't have any children. Right? Two Gedolim and three generations didn't have any children. Chazanish and, and uh, Lubavitch Rebbe. Well, look how many children are named Menachem Mendel, right? Look how many children, what's, what's um, the Rebbe's wife's name? Forgetting right now. What? Chaim Mushka, right? And okay, it's not a competition. I don't have any, there are many children in Avram Yishai also. You have to the Chazunish, you have to the Chazunish as well. That, um, that you can, uh, we don't have answers to all the questions as to why. But we do see that their, their progeny does live on in a different, right? Not biological, but definitely. Um, their nachas is through all the talmidim that they've amassed throughout the generations. Yeah. I believe the Japanese, they have a thing of save somebody's life who's responsible for the. Oh, yeah? Uh huh. So it could be a, so the takeoff of this, you know, Moshe saved Aaron's kids' lives. So since he's responsible for them, he's like their father. 
He saved their lives. Oh, very nice. So adding to this orachai, he saved their lives, therefore he's responsible for them. Very nice. What is that? Okay, we have to look into that Japanese custom. Okay. Okay, very good. The Ksav Kabbalah. So we begin. Ba Midbar is called the nickname. Every Sefer has a nickname. The nickname for Sefer Ba Midbar is Chumash HaPikudim. Why Pikudim? Because there are two counts. It's a lot of tragic stories that happen or fascinating, you know, very rich stories of Mraglim, Korach, Chet Me Mariva. There's so much to unpack. And we will, Bezrat Hashem, unpack those narratives throughout Bamidbar. But within all those stories, there's two countings. Bamidbar and in Parshas Pinchas is another count. So the, the nickname is Chumash HaPikudim. So the way this is expressed many times over, the psukim express the counting is the following. Utzvao ufkudehem. Right, you have two languages. Ela pekude bene Yisrael abesav or some called pekude hamachanos litziv osam. Simply put, why do we count? Why are we counting people right now? What was the plan? To go into Eretz Yisrael. Once you get there to Israel, you need an army. So we're counting men that are able-bodied to fight in the war, right? This is a, by the way, this is the custom that is still Ariyamaza, right? If you, you can age out of the army, right? It's only a certain age range that can go into the army. Now, what's this language? Pikudav, pikudehem, utzvaav. What is utzvaav adding? So the simple understanding of utzvaav is it's referring to the, the legions, meaning I, I am an individual, right? I am counted on my own, I am, but I'm also part of a group, whether that's, uh, there's all these different languages for different types of groups, a base, a unit, a troop, but what, you know, there's all different types of languages within the army about how to express this. The in fact, just to add to this, we are called two different ways, right? We're counted as mispar, Mispar and shame, mispar shemot is brought up. Or Pincus points out something very, very beautiful. Mispar and shemot also is two opposites. You're mispar, you're a number and you're a name. A number is anonymous. You're just a number, right? Nazis, you're just, you're just a number. A shame gives you value. This is who I am, I'm unique. So sometimes, right, we need to show off our individuality. It needs to be prominent in who we are as part of Kla Yisrael. And every single person is unique on their own. But we also need to be a, a mispar. You can't have one and the other. One without the other is, is dangerous. But to be a mispar also you need to fall in line. Certain things that we call to conduct that you fall in line with all of Kla Yisrael. The Ksavah Kabbalah says, what's added here with the word utzva'av? He says something very, very beautiful. He says that here, Utzva'av refers to the family members of the person that's going out to war. Right? Right? It's not just the person that's going out to war. That person has a mother that's thinking about them and a father that's also thinking about them. Probably not as much as the mother, but is, is davening for them that, that they're safe. Has a wife and children that they need to come back to, the Ezra Hashem. That the Torah is recognizing that when one person goes out to war, that person represents so much more. That it's, and there's a sacrifice that is given up, not by that just one person, but really by the entire family unit. Upekudehem Utzva'av is recognizing when one person's going, they're representing so many more people, not just Am Yisrael, but there's so many people that care for them that are going as well. Chazal say that when David HaMelech fought wars, the amount of people that fought in the war, there'd also be that many people learning in the base measures at the time of the war. Why was that? Because you needed one for one. I think a few years ago, there was an, uh, I think with um, it was 2014, when we had the war in the summer, there's an organization that, that, was, that began that every person you could sign up online and you get an email with a name, a Hebrew name of somebody to daven for, right? That you had, there was a chayal there 
and you're somewhere else, you're responsible to, no one else got that name. And you dive in for them while they were stationed away from their family. And the Torah is recognizing the sacrifice of the entire family when going out to war. At the end of the parsha, this is the last thought for today, at the end of the parsha, we recognize the jobs of the Levian and what they need to carry. What's, there's an article by a woman named Devora Ushpizai. Okay, I, I saw this article a few years ago where she does her research and her homework on the weight of how much, like how much did the Oren weigh? You know, based on the amount of gold that needed to be put into it, there are two layers of gold in the Oren plus wood in the middle. And the, you know, the Aron and the Luchos, the Luchos were inside of the Aron, et cetera. And the Luchoshenios were also in the Aron. She argues that it was nearly impossible for somebody to carry, or a few people to carry the Aron. And in fact, we didn't carry the Aron, right? The Aron had two poles that you couldn't remove from it. There were, it was also to remove them. And you had to, you know, technically pick up the poles and carry it. Just, based on the weight of the Oren itself with the gold and the luchos, et cetera, that would be impossible to do. Impossible. The, 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 the weight of the inside would, would break the pulse. So she says, she notes, that this idea is consistent with an idea in the Medrash. The Medrash writes that the Oren, the people didn't carry the Oren, but the Oren was no say, as no self. The Aron carried the people that carried it. And this fits, right? It's great when uh, the, you know, just it fits so nicely. That what this message really is sharing with us is that when we are involved in Torah learning itself, we are not carrying the Torah, but the Torah is carrying us. You can argue that in Simcha Torah, Maybe we're holding the Torah, we're carrying the Torah. On Shavuos, the Dvar Mitzvah is for the Torah to carry us by engaging in serious Talmud Torah and learning Torah throughout the Yantif. The Torah itself is carrying us. And I'll just add with the words of the Levush. The Levush writes, there's a big discussion about what the nature of Birchas Torah is. Right? There's one Bar Mitzvah boy that got very excited because he said, I'm going to stay up all night but I can't stay up all night. So I'm probably gonna take a nap at some point. He asked me already, can I be the guy that says Birch is a Torah for the whole shul? You know, he said, can I be that person? Because last year I slept also, but I couldn't do it because I wasn't Barbara Sia. So excited, so special. So what is the nature of Birch is Torah? So he says, is it a Birch is a mitzvah? What, 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 what is it? Is it a special mitzvah, Birch is a shevach on the Torah itself? So the Levush writes, that it's a birchas hanehanin. It's a bracha on the enjoyment of Torah. And it's a haftacha, usually, right? You make the bracha, eat the app, right? So we're making the bracha because we're showing how much we enjoy. The harevna Hashem elokeinu. That we love the Torah. The Torah gives us so much enjoyment. Here, he says that sometimes you have a mitzvah and sometimes you have hana. He says here, hacha ha mitzvah v'hana'a chada milsa hi. It's one thing. And that's why the Torah, that's why Chazal said, there's many brachos that we make over it. B'chol boker, we make two brachos. Kedeshe achas nechshev is the bracha achrona, alima shalamad et mo. He says something very, very beautiful. He says the first bracha, you, you make two brachas in the morning, really three, but probably one is one. It's probably one and then one a, two A to B. He says one of the brachas you make in the morning is a bracha achrona on the Torah you learned yesterday. And then you make a bracha rishona for the Torah that you're eating, consuming, you know, today. It's a very beautiful thought, right? If it's really a bracha, a bracha sananin, the bracha rishona, and followed by a bracha achrona. So today we learned uh, several thoughts on Parsha Midbar and also on Shavuos. We began by talking about the Torah is compared to and also given in three ways. The Eish B'Torah of Mayim. We learn the idea from Maria Shapiro, his approach. And then we learn the approach of the Ksav Sofer as to what he felt was um, this um, Anivas 
humility and passion and the talk on what that meant for us. Not each person can get half all three. We learned Elo Todos Moshe the Aaron, and it only mentioned the Aaron children. The beautiful thought from the Orchayim, uh, beautiful thought from Yasi Raiman on uh, what that meant as well. And then we move forward to Utzvaav Upekudav. What did that double language mean? It's a family affair when somebody goes out to war. The Torah is recognizing the, the weight that a family carries when somebody goes out to war. And then we discussed literally the carrying of the Aron and what that meant for literally physically couldn't be carried. Aron no say is no sub. When we learn Torah, the Torah carries us. Carries us. Maybe that's what's the difference between Shavuos and Sipas Torah. And we connect that to the beautiful Lavush about Birchus and Anim on Birchus Torah. Wish everybody a wonderful Yantif and a special Man Matan Torah. Have a great Yantif. Have okay. a great Yantif, Rabbi. Okay.